So, I mean, in terms of this book, what started you out on the path to write this? Hmm. Well, I mean, it really, it, the idea for the book came to me uh, kind of in one very specific moment, and I remember it really well. I was standing in front of 950 people at the Bloor Cinema uh, introducing Ken Russell, and I talked about the film. I just had dinner with him, and it didn't go particularly well at dinner, which I write about in the book. And I still didn't know really what was going to happen when he got to the theater. And then finally, he was old and infirm at the time. He, it took him a long time to get down the aisle. And I still wasn't really sure what was going to happen when he got to the front of the stage, whether he would say anything, uh, what kind of mood he was going to be in. Uh, but as I was introducing him and introducing the movie, uh, people were so kind of into it for a movie that was 40 years old that it has rarely ever been seen properly uh, for a filmmaker who had been unfairly kind of neglected for a number of years. Um, they were really, really excited to uh, see him and hear about him. So, you know, I thought, you know what, uh, whatever happens tonight, and it, you know, as it turns out, went really well, but if it hadn't, uh, I still had this idea while I was standing up there that, you know, I'll sell, if I write this book, I'll sell at least 950 of them to the people that are here tonight, and uh, we'll have a hit. Well, it seems so interesting, too, to me that, I mean, did, was it hard convincing him to do this? Because I understand that you had his full consent to do the book. Yeah, no, it wasn't difficult at all. I mean, you know... It, he was a, a, an eccentric, interesting, playful, cantankerous, kind of wonderful guy. And, um, you know, his connection with the book uh, faded after a certain point. He had a series of strokes, and uh, he became less involved. But, you know, there were other people along to pick up the slack, like Mike Bradzell, who was the editor of the original film, who was really crucial to piecing this whole story together. And all the actors that I tracked down, and, and you know, the Peter Maxwell, who wrote the score, and all those people. Uh, help me sort of compile the story when Ken wasn't able to, uh, but pre, you know, up until that point, you know, he wanted this book to be written. He was th this was a, a movie that was really important to him. Uh, it was a movie that I think he saw as his masterpiece uh, that had been unfairly kind of you know thrown ashes thrown to the wind, and he right. wanted attention drawn to it. Well, in terms of the research, it seems like you did some amazing <laughs> research to find some of these people. Who was it who was volunteering? At a oh, that was Murray Melvin. Yeah, he was amazing. I mean, Murray is uh, Father Mignon in the film, and he's incredible. He's, he's so good in the movie. But, you know, you have to keep in mind, this movie's 40 years old. Yeah. Uh, everyone was middle-aged, pretty much, when they when they made the movie. So they're all in their 70s and 80s now. A lot of them are retired. They don't have agents anymore, and Murray is one of them. And uh, he was difficult to find, so I, I just read everything online there was to find about him. I, I read it all, and there was one line in one article that said that uh, the theater that he started out at, which was called uh, the Joan Littlewood Theater in London, right. uh, he volunteered at it one day a week just to sort of say thank you for giving him his start and to get himself out of the house, I guess. So I just called every day for a month until I finally got him. And uh, when I finally did get him, he was more than happy to talk about the movie. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to be able to connect with some of these people because... Otherwise, I mean, no one's really talking about this movie these days. Well, it depends. I mean, if you go online, you have to be very yes. careful. Right. You have to be very careful when you go online. If you start searching uh, anything about the devils, you go to some kind of unsavory <laughs> places. But, but there's a fair amount written about it. In, in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like this white whale that you know film fans have heard about and spent a lot of time, you know, maybe trying to track down online, maybe hopefully, you know, reading my book or, or reading whatever is out there online. Right. But. Um, there is interest in it. It's just that it's so damn difficult to see. Uh, it's getting a little easier now. The BFI DVD is really good. It's not complete, but it's really good. And it's got a nice little booklet that comes with it that's a nice companion piece to it. But, you know, for many, many years, it was next to impossible to see. And, and people, I think, have an appetite for it, if for no other reason, just to check it off the list of right. rare and obscure movies. Yeah. Well, it, it does seem remarkable, though, in this day and age, than when, as you said in the book, that everything is accessible. Mm -hmm. And yet this Back movie up. is not accessible you can, in its full format. You can find... Uh, anything on life. Bad you say, and if, good. Yeah, bad <laughs> and good. You know, if you want to see, you know, uh, the you know Polish stop motion animation like the cameraman's revenge from 1914, you can find it. Uh, it which is what makes it so shocking to me that yeah. you know the the devils 
starring Vanessa Redgrave, Oliver Reed, directed by Ken Russell, hugely expensive, big studio picture, uh, the second biggest set built since they built uh, the set for Cleopatra, which was the biggest, most expensive set ever built for a film to date. And, uh, you know, the, the, this movie has been just ignored and, and completely uh, uh, shuttered, you know, sort of shoved off to the side. And it's just not right. It's a, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It's a challenging film. Right. And it's an upsetting film in a lot of ways. But it really is a, a, a work of genius. And it's not for everybody, and I know that. Right. But it's just, you know, there's a lot of things out there that aren't for everybody, and yet they're available. Right. And this one just isn't. So what do you think is keeping Warners from actually releasing this? Is it just the fact they're afraid of getting wronged by you know, the Southern Baptists or I, something? I, or? You know what? It, it may well be. I, or I, Catholics, I, I guess, it, more, more the Well, point. you know, I mean, th this film was taught by Jesuits in school. Uh, and so, you know, I think what you have to really understand is that it's not a, a, a blasphemous film. It's not no. a sacrilegious film. It's a film that questions things, which is difficult. It's a film that, that ends on a kind of an ambiguous note, and I think possibly therein lies part of the problem. Right. The Exorcist, which came out 23 months later, you know, when that movie is over, you've seen a little girl masturbate with a cross, you've seen all sorts of things happen, but at the end of that movie, good triumphs evil. Yes. And at the end of The Devils, well, you know, to begin with, there weren't that many good characters. I mean, there's great characters, but there weren't that many pure characters right. uh, in the film to begin with. Uh, everyone's got, you know, some dark skeleton hidden, or maybe in some, most cases not so hidden, uh, in their closet. And by the time the movie ends, you just are left with this feeling like, oh, good doesn't win, evil kind of wins, and ah, uh, you know, and, and I think that's possibly part of the the issue that people have with this is that there's it, it leaves you unsettled and you know say what you will about the exorcist it will uh, you know it will freak you out it will scare you but at the end it's unequivocal what happens and i mean you know rosemary's baby though on the other end you know evil kind of wins i don't it's a spoiler sorry people but you know it's <laughs> you know evil in in a certain way sort of wins over on the end of that one right. but again it's it's a much different kind of, of feel that the movie right. has and so the sexuality certainly changes the context as well well yeah i mean when you start mixing and matching sex violence and religion you know, you're asking for it, essentially. And Ken Russell probably knew that when he was making the film. Um, and, you know, I, I would assume that when he sent it over, because he, he ran the script past uh, John Trevain, the, the, the censor at the time, and then uh, again, you know, the, afterwards, uh, when the film was made, he was more than willing to make some cuts to get this film seen. Uh, it was just sort of the amount of cuts that he had to make, I think, surprised him. And, and you know, the, the fact is, that 40 years later, there's been director's cuts of hundreds of movies released since right. then, and yet this one uh, languishes. Well, and what's amazing, too, is that culture has changed, and as you say in the book, to a certain extent, it hasn't changed in some ways, but... You well, know, you'd expect that there'd be a little bit more acceptance at this point for this film. Maybe. Well, considering how absolutely timely The Devils is now, right. in, in the sense that it's a, a in, in, I mean, it's a lot of things. It's a complicated movie on, on many levels. But, you know, at its core, it, it's a, a study of church and state and the divide or perhaps not the divide between those two. And I think that's a really timely yeah. idea to be exploring right now, particularly when we're, you know, nearing the end of, of a hard fought presidential campaign in the U S where religion has been an issue. Uh, you know, people, I think uh, I find this topic kind of endlessly fascinating, and I think The Devils does a really fantastic job at exploring it, but you know, you wouldn't know that because you probably hadn't seen it. So what do you think the genius of, of his works were? I mean, not just The Devils, but in general. What was his genius? Well, I mean, I think that he was a master storyteller. I think that visually uh, he made films that were really unique and really interesting for their, for their time and beyond. I think that um, he is someone who managed to uh, take all his uh, obsessions and all his, um, you know, his, his, his most deeply held beliefs and work them into his art. And Guillermo del Toro told me that there is not a director alive who wouldn't be envious of the thematic consistency from the very first you know, short films onto the work that he did with the BBC onto the onto the big screen. There's a line 
almost a straight line that you can draw all the way through his very beginnings right to the very end of his life. And it's a remarkable body of work and it's a challenging body of work and it's, it, it is, you know, a truly artful and beautiful uh, body of work. You know, I wish more people were seeing it, could see it. I wish uh, it was more widely available on DVD, not just The Devils, but, you know, the stuff that he made for the BBC and right. all that stuff. It's, you know, it's come and gone. There have been videotapes, there have been some DVDs, but there's, you know, Criterion or someone should pick up this right. and do the, you know, like they've just recently done, not Criterion, but uh, they've recently done with Alfred Hitchcock and the yes. new box set. Ken Russell is perfect for that kind of thing. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you... At the end of this whole thing, what did you take away from doing this whole process? I think the the thing that I took away from it, I mean, it took years. This right. wasn't this wasn't a particularly quick one, and um, you know, a lot of it was just tracking down people and that sort of thing. Right. Just time, just time spent finding people. And I think the the thing that I learned was not so much, you know, about the division of church and state. I think I knew a lot about that beforehand. I knew a lot about the movie before I wrote the book. I think what I took away from it, uh, from studying Ken Russell and studying the the, uh, the the trajectory of his career, was uh, that you never give up. No matter what obstacles are laid before you, uh, if you are a creative person, if you're someone uh, who believes in the art that you're making or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, never ever give up. And the persistence that he showed up to the end of his life. I mean, when he was literally making movies, uh, you know, in his backyard with a video camera and using friends as actors. I mean, this is a guy who had vision who never stopped trying to express that vision. And what, I, what Ken Russell taught me was that it's not so much the career, it's the work. Right. And it's not so much, uh, you know, it's more about expressing yourself than it is about making sure that, uh, you know, you're article gets printed on the front page rather than the, the second page below the fold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's really interesting too in this age of filmmakers that I feel, I guess, often that there's not as many iconic directors that we turn to like we did maybe a few years ago and sometimes it's the actors doing the, the limelight for a lot of these projects. Do well, you I, have any commentary on that? Well, I mean, I think it's always been kind of, you know, 50-50. I mean, I think you had... You know, I think maybe people 50 years ago said, oh, the new John Ford movie is coming out. It's going to be a Western. I'm going to love it. You know, right. I'm going to go see that. Maybe, maybe they did, but they were just as likely to go John Wayne, sure. you know, who starred in a great many of those. And, you know, now, I mean, I, there are name directors still, but they've, most of them have been working for a while, you know, Scorsese and, and the like. But, I mean, I think people know Guillermo del Toro. I think people know what to expect when they go see a Michael Bay movie. Right. And, and those are names that have a, a certain significance uh, to audiences that ring true. I'm not sure that's true with a lot of directors, but I'm not really sure it's been true ever. I mean, there's right. there have been directors throughout the years that you know, have been very popular for a while and maybe on the strength of their name could sell uh, tickets, but it's, you know, Sam Peckinpah probably right. was another one of them, Orson Welles, you know, I mean, there's there are a few of them, but, you know, today, I mean, I think there's just probably just as many. I just, I, I don't know if people really understand what directors do and, and right. today, maybe they don't care, I don't know, but, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I think it's always been kind of this way. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that the role of books like, like your mm -hmm. book, I mean, that they can kind of expound on that fact of what the directors actually are doing when they're making these films. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I hope people read the book, whether you've seen the movie or not, right. uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, the, the book uh, it tells you everything you need to know to understand why this movie was made and then what happened to it afterwards. And the story of... The, the writing and the making of and then what happened to the the movie afterwards I think is uh, you know almost as interesting as the movie itself and you know they're two different two different things but you don't necessarily have to have seen the film right. but what I would like this to be is a gateway for people to go right. oh you know Ken Russell well I should rent Savage Messiah or try and find women in love or you know any any of the other you know couple of dozen films now I mean one of my last questions of the book is you know to play the devil's advocate Maybe censorship has a place in the world. Do you think, considering the, I don't know, I don't know how to describe the scene that, mm -hmm. that basically the main scene that's missing, but I mean, basically it's... Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's called the sure. rape of Christ yes. scene. Tell Those us. are words that don't roll off the tongue very easily, <laughs> I get that, but um, it's based on historical fact. Right. 
And what Ken Russell did was visualize it. Now, Aldous Huxley, who wrote about it extensively in a classic book called The Devils of Loudon, yeah. um, when he was approached, not by Ken Russell, but by another filmmaker to turn this into a film, he said, you can't do it, it'll blow people's minds, it's too much. And uh, he was very, very clear about that. Uh, Ken Russell did not take that advice, and he did visualize it. And once you've seen it, it cannot be unseen. And it's it's quite something. It's an orgy in a church with naked nuns, and, and things happen. Outrageous things happen. Um, I think it is a testament to Ken, the power of Ken Russell's camera that the, the this footage is still deemed, 40 years later, so dangerous. So mind-bendingly shocking, that. yeah, that that you know we're not allowed to see it. Right. So that's a testimony to Ken. As for your sort of the, the base of your question, whether or not there's a place for censorship, probably, you know. But I, I think that censorship. I don't like the word much, but I, I think the only time that I want to entertain the idea of censorship is only after a great deal of discussion with. Right. smart people that know what they're talking about and you know working with artists and and you know I, I, I don't think that any work uh, should be condemned simply because it offends that guy right. you know I think that it, it's more of a general consensus thing maybe you know I, I can't really imagine an instance you know I don't want to watch snuff films right. I don't want to watch snuff films and and you know snuff films should you know should be censored I'll go out on a limb and say <laughs> snuff films should be censored. But beyond that, right. art that that is art, uh, and you know, the, the, by its very nature, art and artists push envelopes and you know try and you know it's it, 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 it's not always just enough to entertain. Right. Often that's enough, and often that's what people go to the movies for. And you know, when I review a movie like The Master and give it four and a half stars. Uh, and then start getting nasty emails from people saying, I can't believe I went to see this and we paid for drinks beforehand and then it cost me 75 bucks. And I, I can't, you know, well, you know, perhaps, you know, a movie like The Master or The Devils or something that's going to challenge you right. and not necessarily entertain you in a more traditional way isn't for you. And that's okay. That's absolutely okay. There's movies out there for everybody. And, and, and I think that The Devils is a great example of a movie that is there to uh, really bring out something in you. Whether it's comfortable or not is another question, but right. it's going to affect you one way or the other. Amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.